So yes, this is a case study for Ken, W1YJ, who was uh, wondering what kind of an antenna he could put up at his location. We discussed loops and we discussed uh, dipoles and G5RVs and uh, there is uh, quite a few uh, different reasons to use one antenna over another. This is a, a satellite view of Ken's home. This is north here, as you can see. And uh, he does have an external tuner. He wants to uh, get on multiple bands. And uh, after thinking about a loop around the house, I suggested using a G5 RV. He has a 90 foot span over here, as you could see. And uh, a typical G5 RV to cover 80 through 10 is 102 feet. And uh, I'll show you how we handle that. His trees, he claims, are about 20, 30 feet tall. It's important to know in advance what you're trying to achieve with any proposed new antenna. You've got to really determine uh, you're trying to work local stations, DX, multiple bands or one band, and what are the desired directions you want to speak with. You have to bear in mind the space you have and how much you have to spend. No single antenna can meet everyone's desires 100%. That's why there's so many different antennas. Ken did ask me about a loop. Some people find loops less noisy than open-ended antennas. Open-ended means an antenna where the ends are out in, in, in the open air. They're not connected to anything, such as a standard dipole or a G5 RV. The loop requires four supports, whereas a dipole requires just two. And I mentioned to Ken, if he puts a loop completely around his house, one of the problems is he's going to be picking up noise from things in his house, emanating from his house, computers, electric motors, heating systems, charging devices. So as that noise emanates in all directions, he's going to pick it up. That was another reason I, just, I told him he should put a G5 RV over on this area here. Now, there is a reason that I suggested here going sort of north-south versus over here, or over here, or over, over here. This is where he, he's going to, his shack is around over in this point here. And he'll run his feed line from this point right into the shack over here. OK. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little further on horizontal loop antennas, single band and fan dipoles, offset effect dipoles, verticals, and the G5 RV. All right, let's go to this next slide. Here we have a comparison of standard dipole antennas at different heights. It's important to understand the effect house has on dipole antennas. It also has similar effect on other horizontal antennas. So what you're looking at here are what they call elevation patterns. This is sort of like looking at your antenna from the side. Now, these are four different, uh, of, uh, four, what do we have? Four, seven different versions, starting from one eighth wave, quarter wave, half wave, one and a quarter. I think this is, uh, yeah, this is three quarters, I'm sorry. This is one wave, one and a half, and two 
two wavelengths. Now, you could see here with a quarter, with an eighth of a wave, most of your RF is going straight up. And this is pretty much the same at a quarter wave high. It's, it's a little, you're getting a little more going out towards the sides with the quarter wave. But still, most of your RF is going straight up. That's very good for NVIS. When you want to bounce signals uh, off the ionosphere or, and have them come back down to Earth fairly close by. Okay. Over here, some people call those cloud warmers when they're very, very low. But look what happens when you go a half wave high. There's hardly anything going upwards. Oh, you got lobes going left and right at a fairly low takeoff angle. This is about 30 degrees where you have your maximum gain at a 30 degree point. So it's not going to be that great for uh, short range as this is, but it'll be better for an overall, overall uh, antenna uh, performance and uh, especially long range. Now uh, over here at three quarters, look what happens. You, you still got these uh, lower lobes, but you got another lobe up here. And that will give you some, some of that uh, cloud warming effect. But if you notice, this lobe here is lower than it is here. This is called the takeoff angle. Maximum gain is lower than, than 30 degrees. As you start going higher, the lower takeoff angles start to appear. Look over here. I'm going to go all the way down. This is two wavelengths high. Notice you have multiple lobes. The higher you go, the more lobes you start getting. Now over here, this at two wavelengths high, this shows you the lowest takeoff angle, which is very good for DX. However, remember, two wavelengths high, uh, for example, on, on uh, 80 meters, uh, well, one wavelength is uh, 260 feet. So you're talking 520 feet high to get this performance on 80 meters with a half wave dipole. Not too many people will get their antennas up that high. Okay. Most ham antennas are about 30 feet high. Most 80 meter dipoles, 30 feet. That's very good for nighttime QSOs because you do get that NVIS effect because it's quite low. 30, 30 feet for 80 meters is quite low. NVIS at night, We'll, we'll give you out a range out to about 600 miles. You might get more, but average about 600 max. And on the 40 meters, that's great for uh, nighttime. During the day, 40 meters at a low height will uh, also give you NVIS. Okay, let's go down to the next slide. This is a comparison of a half wave dipole a half wave high, this is it here, with a half wave vertical dipole. That's this dotted pattern. As you can see, the gain with the dipole is considerably more than with the half wave vertical dipole. Now bear in mind, most people when they put up a dipole, they don't use a vertical dipole. They use a ground mounted vertical with a lot of radials. And those radials are on the ground or, or, or buried in the, in the lawn. And that performs, that type performs even worse than this compared to a standard dipole. The, that, that dipole, that vertical ground mount that will have a gain maybe out to about here to this point. So it's a big difference between the uh, dipole half wave high and a ground mounted vertical. A lot of people say, why are uh, verticals so noisy? Well, one of the reasons are it's the only antenna that receives noise equally well over 360 degrees. As you can see here, the horizontal antenna has 60 dB gain compared to this particular vertical dipole over standard ground. 
Okay, let's go to the next. Here we have a 40 meter dipole, half wave dipole. Everybody knows how to make one of these. This is the formula, 468 divided by the frequency equals the feet. Our half wave dipole usually gives you between 50 and 73 ohms, depending upon its height. For example, a 40 meter can also be used on 15 meters. It's a third harmonic, but you might need a tuner because the SWR will not be that low. If fed with coax, it'll be a poor performer on other bands. Okay. Um, you can use it for other bands, but the, uh, uh, when you feed it with coax, the performance, the performance does diminish because of high SWR and losses. The 50 ohms shows up when you have a, the antenna, the dipole up at about one eighth wave. That's where you get 50 ohms. When you're that low, you should see an SWR of one to one at the resonant point. If your dipole is a half wave high, you should not see an SWR that low. You'll probably see 1.2, 1.3 to one at the resonant point. Okay, let's go. Now we're, we're looking at fan dipoles. Fan dipoles are excellent antennas if you want to use coax only. Each dipole for each band is connected to one feed point right here. And for example, this could be 80, this could be 40, this could be 20. And you can put them, you can put them up in this configuration where the, the, uh, the uh, 80 meter is straight and the other higher frequency dipoles fan out like this. You would have to use little spacers like this or ropes pulling them or strings so that they are uh, fairly taut. You could also use spacers hanging from the 80 meter, short spacers, and then run the dipoles all parallel. So you could have 80, 40, 20, and 10, whatever, and they would all be dipole. There are some companies that manufacture fan dipoles like that. Now, uh, Ken's site does not have room for a full-sized 80 meter dipole without using loading coils. And we didn't want to do that. Bear in mind, if you do put up a fan dipole, when you tune it for lowest SWR, you've got to start with the lowest band first. Once that's adjusted, then you go to the next higher frequency. If you don't start out that way, if you start up here and then work downwards, you'll be chasing your tail. It'll take you many, many attempts to get everything uh, correct. So you've got to remember, start from the lowest frequency, adjust that, and then go to the next higher and up. That's the fan dipole. You could feed it with 50 ohm coax. Now, OCNFED dipoles have been getting uh, popular. OCFD, some people call them. They've been getting popular. I'm hearing more and more of them on the air. I used one in 1960. It was fed with balanced line. In those days, we called it a Wyndham antenna because the fellow who invented it was named Wyndham. So what's old is new again. If you plan to use one of these, you should educate yourself to the antenna patterns this antenna produces. So you won't be disappointed after installing it. There are multiple lobes and uh, certain directions you uh, will not be getting very much power out in, the, in certain directions and you might expect that you are. So that's the off center fed dipole. Now I'm gonna to get to the G5RV. This was an antenna designed by an English fellow whose core was G5RV. This is his name, Lou Varney. 
it has been uh, modified somewhat by a fellow in South Africa, ZS6PKW. It is not resonant on any amateur band. Not resonant. Might sound very peculiar. It includes open wire feed line that transforms the impedance for efficient matching on multiple bands. It usually uses about 33 to 34 feet of open wire line, 450 ohm. It'll work on some bands with a radio's internal tuner because the SWR is below three to one. If you have certain bands where it's over, then you'll need an external tuner. Many amateurs think only resonant antennas can radiate. That is a myth. The G5 RV disproves that myth thousands of times a day. If you want a simple multi-band performer, I encourage you to make one. They're easy to assemble. I suggest using a homemade choke pile and using ferrite beads that slip over the coax where the balance line transitions to the coaxial cable. These beads tend to choke off common mode currents and can also reduce noise that is picked up on the feed line. The use of beads in this fashion on coax are an excellent choice for any type of coaxial fed antenna. Again, with the G5 RV, you should understand the patterns as they are, of the antenna as they are widely and wildly different depending on the band of use. I did recommend the G5 RV for Ken. Now let's take a look at some of the antenna patterns of, of various uh, antennas that I've discussed. This is the G5 RV. It's 102 feet total length. Here's your 450 ohm line. Some pe people use 300 ohm line. I, I suggest 400 ohm balance line. And this is the coax. It could be any length. This is where those beads would slip on to create a choke ballon. Now, Ken cannot fit that into his property. He, he only has 90 feet. So I modeled a shortened G5 RV, 45 feet on a side, 90 feet with six foot tails. Here they are. So he could just bend down the tails. He can have these drooping with a little weight on the bottom, just hanging. His ropes would go out that way, or he could run a string from this to the ground or to some tree. It doesn't have to be straight down. It could be on an angle. It'll still work. The difference between this and the standard 102 foot perfectly straight G5 RV is extremely minimal, maybe one tenth of one dB difference. So nothing to be concerned with. Okay, now let's take a look at some antenna patterns. This is a 20 meter dipole. All of this pair in mind, all these models are at 30 feet above the ground. Here's a standard dipole 20 for 20 meters. And here's a G5 RV pattern. Now this is what you call the bird's eye view pattern. This is if you were up in the air looking down at it. Now, where is the antenna, the wire? Very cute. I click that and the antenna wire goes away. Well, okay. This is the antenna. This is the way the antenna is running. Now notice with, the, with, a, with a half wave dipole, you get everything going left and right. You have two lobes. These are lobes. And it's, they're very broad. From here to here is, uh, I don't know, maybe, uh, it's about 90 degrees. This is the 3 dB bandwidth, the beam width. Beyond from here, from here to here is where you get most of your gain. At this point, the gain is 3 dB down from this point. Here's where maximum gain is. 6.6 .6 dB gain. It's the same going in this direction. 
So if this antenna was running north south, you would have maximum gain going east and west if this was north. Now look at the G5 RV on 20 meters. It doesn't it doesn't have most of the gain going due east. It's going northeast. Here's where this little green dot shows your maximum gain is now shared by three major lobes. One, two, three, four, these corners. And the maximum gain is 45 degrees approximately from where the wire is running. A lot of people who have G5 RVs, they don't understand this fact. Now, uh, here's east. So you've got a little bit going east. It's a very narrow lobe, but look what's going on over here. It's quite a dead area in here and over here. So if you've got this antenna, if you've got signals out towards, towards uh, Southern Europe, if you have your antenna north-south, this will be going to most of Europe, but Southern Europe, you're gonna be uh, have, have poor, pretty, uh, poor performance compared to uh, Northern Europe or Central Europe. So these are very important to understand where your dead spots are. Of course, off the ends of the antenna, you don't have much, but you do have a little more than you do with the dipole. So th those are very important factors to consider. All right, let's compare with the G5 RV what it look uh, what it looks like. Now you remember what the dipole looked like. Here's the dipole. Try to keep that pattern in your mind. Okay, whoops. This is the G5 RV on 17 meters. Again, four lobes, 15 meters, four lobes. 10 meters, you've got four major lobes and two minor lobes. Now back to 17. Again, north-south, you've got a, a great lobe going northeast, southeast, northwest towards Asia, and southwest towards Australia. But look what you've got broadside uh, to, uh, if, you ha if you had put this thing up, thinking at putting a broadside to Europe. Let's say you aim this so it was broadside to Europe. Look at the dead area you've got in here. It shows here, oh, that's interesting. We just had unlimited minutes. I don't know how we did that, but okay. We'll find out later. This area here, right in this area right here is down over 30 decibels. So if you make the mistake of putting a G5E up broadside to Europe, if you want to speak to Europe, you're going to be very disappointed. People, most people do not understand that with the G5RV. The G5RV splits into at least four lobes once you go 20 meters and up. Look at 15 meters. Now you've got some nice gain. These are, these are pretty good gain here, but look how narrow the lobes are. Again, dead spots going this way. 10 meters, you have some nice gain. Mostly, most of them will work towards Europe if you, if you have the antenna oriented north-south. And on 10 meters, you don't have, you have at least a little lobe going east-west. So that would go towards, uh, towards Africa from this area anyway. Same over here. This is dead towards Africa over here, pretty much dead. Same thing here. On 17 meters, you're going to do pretty poorly in the U.S. towards the due west. You'll do good towards the northwest and southwest, but you're going to do poorly towards the west. So these are important things to understand about the G5 RV. Now, here is, again, the... Uh, loop configuration around Ken's house. The loop has a little more gain in certain selected directions than a G5 RV. And we'll see what, what that looks like. The loop is difficult to match with coax, so it's best to use open wire feed line and an external tu tuner, which will allow multi-band use. 
as I mentioned before, any noise coming from uh, things in the house, heating systems, chargers, all sorts of things will be picked up by these wires. And again, it's harder to put it up. And uh, that's the loop. Ken wanted to put this up initially. I said, look, Ken, why don't you put this up, the G5 RV. If you don't like it or if you want to still try a loop, you could always put up two, three wires like this and extend, just attach them to the G5 RV and you'll have a closed loop. So that's in the future. Okay. Here's the G5 RV compared to that loop, all again at 30 feet above ground. And you remember what the dipole looks like now. 20 meters, the wire is going this way here, north-south. Again, a good gain towards northeast. But look at the loop. The loop shows a gain of 10 dB, almost 3 dB, more than, yeah, uh, it's more than 3 dB, more than this. But it's only in this direction and this direction. You see the two lobes are, are, are large here, but as you go this way, they get small. So loops are directive on certain frequencies. And you have to understand that before you start putting one of these up and then get disappointed. The G5 RV on 20 does give you some, some uh, signal and reception broadside to the antenna going this way. But look here, not much with the, with the loop. The loop is directive opposite from the point that you feed it. So if you feed it in a corner, the, the directivity will sort of go out towards the, uh, towards the uh, opposite corners. For example, if you feed it here, this one, this, in this model, it's fed over here. So you have maximum gain in that direction. I shouldn't say in that direction, towards this direction, but the maximum gain is this way, north, east, south, east. That's with the loop, feeding it over in this direction here on the west. Okay. Here's the G5 RV versus the loop on 15 meters. Now over here, you've got four lobes, 10.3 dBi gain in each one of these four lobes. Nothing much going this way. The loop gives you pretty much the same gain, slightly more, in two, two locations. But it's not the same going this way or this way. You do get a little gain going this way versus the uh, G5 RV, but it's uh, quite a different shape compared to this. Okay. This is the G5 RV on 10 meters. Again, we saw that before comparing to the loop. Again, a little more gain with, with the loop, but it's only over this little narrow lobe here and this one. So if you're trying to talk to somebody in Europe in one particular area, you know, this might work better. But I don't advise using it just for that purpose. If you can figure out a way to rotate your loop, you'll, then, you, then, you, then it might be of, of a, a beneficial uh, idea, a good idea. But I don't suggest try to rotate your loop. Okay to know about using the 130 foot span. And uh, you had already addressed that, uh, that the 90 foot span uh, was preferred for aesthetic reasons. Uh, the 130, if you use a full, that's a full size 80 meter dipole. If you feed that with balanced line, yes, you can use it on multiple bands. However, the tuning is much more difficult. Why is that? On the multiple frequencies, harmonic frequency such as 40 and 20, you have very high impedance. And your internal tuner on a radio will not tune it. 
they go up to three to one. And uh, that is why I don't suggest using a, a full size 80 meter dipole for multiple bands. It's much more difficult for tuning. The tuning is much sharper. If you do tune, if you tune off slightly off frequency, if you move your radio, then you got to constantly retune. Uh, the tuning is much easier with the G5RV. It's not as uh, uh, not as uh, tricky or sharp. Okay, what was the other question? Masa? Look, we're gonna uh, switch to a quick question um, from KB1AL. He wants to know about running 450 line versus coax all the way to the shack. That's a quickie. Why don't you take that, take it away, Jay? Running coax from, uh, I, well, I, I don't know which antenna you mean. If you're running coax to a multi-band antenna, yes, you can do that. But you will have very high SWR on, uh, on especially if it's a G5RV. If you use a G5RV, that's not resonant on any band. You'll have very high SWRs on all of the uh, bands. And you will have high losses because of those S of that high SWR, you'll have uh, losses uh, in heat. And uh, it's not a good idea. You won't get, you'll get uh, a lot of uh, reduction in your power output getting to the antenna when you use coax on many of the bands as compared with using the G5 RV. Or if you use straight 450 ohm line right to the shack, uh, you can do that, and that also reduces your losses tremendously as compared with using coax. For example, I have a 160-foot dipole up in the air, and I feed that with balanced line. It's 300 feet long. The, the computed losses on that are a half a dB on the 40-meter band. If I used 300 feet of 50-ohm coax, I believe I can, it was about a seven decibel loss. That is that is unacceptable. And uh, with 7 dB, you would get a big reduction in the amount of power that you got to your antenna and a large reduction in the received signals. So that's why it's not a good idea uh, to use coax on a multiple band antenna. Unless it's a, for example, if you have a tuner a remote tuner at the feed point of the dipole. In other words, if it's up in the air, the tuner, that's fine. Then you could use coax. Or if you use a fan dipole, that's also fine. But if you're trying to use just a straight dipole without a tuner at its feed point, it's a poor idea to use coax on multiple bands. Okay. Jay, we're going to go to... Um... Uh, Fred Zlotkin, Frederick Zlotkin, excuse me, um, he has says that his G5 RV is very hard to load on 10 meters. Why? Okay. Hello, Fred. Uh, I, I, uh, Fred, I helped him put that uh, 105 up. He feeds with balanced line. Uh, that could be the length of the... Uh, of the uh, 450 ohm line might have to be varied slightly. Sometimes you uh, will get a very high impedance or high reactance. And the only way to get around that is by adjusting the length of the uh, feed line, maybe make it on 10 meters, maybe a foot or two longer. However, bear in mind that might affect the other bands, the tuning of the other bands. And uh, yeah, that's that's probably what the problem is. Okay, Jay, Jay you want to speak to NFED antennas? We have a couple of questions about NFED antennas and random length NFED antennas. Okay, what is the question about uh, NFED? Uh, what is your opinion for this situation using an NFED? Okay, NFED antennas, uh, they're also becoming very popular. Some use uh, nine to one balance. Uh, I think that's probably the most popular nine to one balance. However, bear in mind, you have to use some type of a counterpoise wire when you use an NFED antenna. Uh, otherwise, you, you will have problems, uh, more problems with, with 
tuning, you'll have problems with comment mode currents, RF getting on the, uh, on the shield of the coax. And if you look at the manufacturers who make them, they'll always tell you to use uh, a counterpoise wire. It could be usually just one length, probably 20, 30 feet. I just had an example where uh, K2NY, John, he was using a 117 foot uh, NFED wire, which he had up in uh, Claryville, New York. And uh, I was trying to work him on 75 meters. He was running it and he was, uh, I was hearing him S4 on 80 meters one night. I asked him, did he put a counterpoise on? He said, no. I said, just put a piece of wire on it and drop it, lay it on the ground or whatever. And uh, and he did that. Actually, I just realized it was not in Claryville. It was in Windham, New York. He was in a motel, a hotel, and he was loading up the rain gutter on the motel. Fortunately for him, his, his balcony uh, had a downspout leading to the rain gutter, which was 100 feet long approximately. So he uh, connected his coax to the... Uh, uh, what do you call it, to the uh, downspout. And it didn't work too well. He was S4. I told him to put a 30-foot uh, counterpoise on, and that was basically an NFED antenna, what he was doing. Uh, his antenna was S4. His gutter antenna was S4. He put 30 feet of wire onto the shield where it, where it connected to the downspout and the signal went up to 10 over 9. Big improvement. And that counterpoise was laying on the ground. Of course, his antenna was all wet. His antenna was in the gutter. And he made all the nice Christmas lights blink on and off as he sent Morse code. Fortunately for him, I don't think anybody in the parking lot knew Morse code. Otherwise, they would have figured it was K2NY. <laughs> OK. Any nice? comments, any comments, Jay, about the proximity of 450 ohm ladder line to the ground? And then we'll get to David's question. Uh, yeah, ladder line, when you say proximity to the ground, I assume you mean lie, laying it on the ground. It should not be laying it on the ground. It should, definitely don't lay it on the ground. And when you do use ladder line, also known as balanced line, it should be at least six inches away from metallic objects. And you cannot coil it up on top of itself. I have an instance where a ham who I suggested put up a 105 foot center fed dipole fed with balance line. And he put it up and he said, it's working up pretty good, but not that good. And I said, how much feed line to use? He says, oh, I have a hundred feet of feed line. I said, really? 100 feet. How far is it from your house? He says, about 30 feet. I said, well, what are you doing? How'd you uh, run that 100 feet of balance line? So I coiled it up on itself and I taped it up nice and neat to itself. <laughs> the bad news. I told him, cut it and don't have any coils. And then it worked very well. Uh, so balance, also another thing you must bear in mind, anytime you use balance line, it's susceptible to snow and rain. The capacitance of the line changes slightly, and you might have to retune for SWR when it gets wet or when it has snow on it. That is apparent the higher you go in frequency. Uh, and I guess that's about anybody, any other questions on balanced line? No, but Masa wants to know um, why hams in the United States uh, do uh, prefer wire antennas uh, as opposed to in Japan, where um, it seems to be that they're using towers and yagis. Uh, I think, uh, Jay, we'd yeah. love to hear your opinion, but any, anybody's welcome to chime in okay. in, the, in the chat box. Okay. Uh, I'm sure there's a, a, a number of reasons why there, there's not as many towers and yagis yeah. uh, in, in our shack. So everybody's yeah. welcome to chime in the chat box here. Well, uh, Masa, hello, Masa. Uh, I would assume that most of the hams that we speak to in Japan 
that we could hear from here are using big antennas. It's mm -hmm. going to be difficult to work the USA from Japan yeah. with a G5 RV that's inside your attic and it's 15 feet above the ground. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. the Japanese hams, they have done very well economically. So they have all that money over there. <laughs> they could buy those big antennas and those big towers. Us poor Americans, we had, a lot of us have to deal with wire antennas, Masa. Uh, but the U.S. ham has a, a big property, right, than the Japanese one, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the biggest beam I've ever seen, uh, one of the biggest, is, uh, is from a Japanese ham. Uh, I'm trying to remember his call sign. Uh, mm -hmm. You know who that is, Masa? Yeah. The fellow with the 80 meter full size beam up at about 250 feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there, yeah, yeah. there yeah. is a ham. He, obviously, he's got a lot, a lot of money. Listen, when it comes to antennas, one could put anything up that they could afford if they have the space. The bigger the antenna and the higher it is to a certain point, and the more gain it has, the better you will do. But okay. unfortunately, we all, all don't have the space to do all that. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you very much. Okay, Today. you're welcome. Okay. This is a very interesting question um, from David Wright, uh, who talks about, um, he, he wants to know what the impact is uh, of uh, folding or, or putting the antenna elements at 90 degrees. Uh, I guess the way we, uh, described in the slide, if, if that's going to cause some sort of um, vertical component of radiation. So um, why don't you take that away? Uh, I assume he means where I bent the uh, G5 RV at six feet. Those tails, I think that's what he's talking about. Um, Correct. Okay. That will be, I checked that, that will be insignificant on all of the bands that you use it. Whatever vertical component you get, it will be very, it will be insignificant. If you started bending it, in other words, just instead of making each leg 45 feet as shown in the drawing, uh, if we did that, uh, if we made it instead of 45 feet, if you made it uh, 22 feet and then made it 23 foot vertical, then you'd have a major change uh, and it would not perform as well as a standard G5 RV. So that's the, that's my answer to that. Is there, uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, are you still there, Lewis? Yeah, I, I see um, a comment. Uh, we have one ham who uh, is doing really well with off-center fed dipoles. Uh, of course, that's a, a very popular arrangement, and um, you, you talked about a lot of the advantages there. Um, so th that's certainly something to consider for this uh, scenario. Um, but I, I don't see any other uh, specific questions. If somebody has a question that I missed, um, feel free to go ahead and uh, repeat it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the NFED antennas, uh, do work, they do work very well in certain directions. Uh, bear in mind, one of the things I hear over the years when people describe how well their antennas perform, and they say, oh, my antenna is working very well. And I ask them, well, how do you determine that? And they say, well, I uh, worked England, and I worked Italy, and I worked someplace in the Pacific. And I work Japan. And where, when I hear that, I'm always amazed at, at that comment. That is not a criteria of how well an antenna is performing. For example, I have worked all over the world with a four foot antenna on a mobile setup. My good friend Tom, K2UQT, we mounted an I. C 706 in his car many years ago, we had a four or five foot whip on it. Now that whip was what? Three feet above the ground, the bottom of it. 
And we worked. The first day we put it in, we worked a station in India. India. Now, going by the criteria that some people use, oh, my antenna is wonderful. I worked here. I worked there. I could say, well, I have a wonderful antenna on this mobile. I worked India. That is not a measure of how well an antenna works. It just, in most of the cases, if you have a poor antenna and you work somebody very far away, that person very far away had probably a very big antenna with a lot of gain. And that's why he was able to hear you. If you have a poorly uh, performing antenna, the people that will hear you far away are the people that have very good antennas. A person that's far away from you on the other side of the earth with an antenna like yours, which is a poor performer, he won't hear you and you won't hear, he, he, you won't hear them. I have a 20 meter beam that when I put it up at 60, 70 feet, it's a five element that has very high gain. I hear people in Europe with indoor dipoles running for five watts. And they tell me, I've never worked America before. And I'm a rickshaw, so I'll sit and talk with them for 10, 20 minutes. And, and they keep saying they can't believe it. I've never worked America before. Jay, we got a question from Stanley WA2NRV. He wants to know uh, what Ken was running before. And Ken, if you're here um, still, please um, feel free to chime in and go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, no, uh, I, basically I had a, it was a 160 meter, it was cut, you know, more or less to be a 160 meter dipole, but it was uh, put up in, in a Z pattern, just, just because of the way the property, you know, the size of the property. There was a little distortion there. I don't know if you were close to, too close to your mic or you had a lousy antenna. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I didn't, I, I heard you say something about a 160 meter antenna. Uh, Luigi, did you get that? I, I did understand, he said at 160 in a Z pattern, uh, but repeat it again, Ken, your mic, your audio is okay. Go ahead and repeat it one more time slowly. Yeah, yeah. Let, me, let me just uh, switch to a different mic. How's that, any better? Yeah, yeah, don't talk too close to the mic. Yeah, no, it's fine. No, it was, you know, it was cut up, you know, it was cut up, you know, it was a 160, half, you know, 160 meter half wave. But you know, it was put up. You know, basically, you know, we have one, two, three, you know, three, four. You know, I had four, you know, four, four uh, ropes up in the air, and you know, basically, it look, look, you know, if you're looking from above, you know, it looks like a Z. In you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't, so it wasn't a, a true a street flat top. It worked, right? It, it, it worked okay. I mean, you know, I mean, I in the. Um, I think the bands that you know that I was able to you know, really de uh, handle best were probably 20 and 40, you know, 20, 40, and 80. Um, right. you know, 10 was never good, you know, 10, 10 was terrible, but then that uh, was to be expected. <laughs> and also, I, I, if I was uh, if I uh, ever tuned down to 10, I you know had to cut the power down because I was getting RF back in the shack. Yeah, yeah, 100, you know, 100. How high was that 160 meters? You know, I mean, it wasn't you know any higher than probably 30, 40 feet max, you know. Okay. Um, well, you see, that's a long, a long antenna. That's two hundred and sixty feet, approximately. Yeah. When you operate, yeah, it was. Half, yeah, it, it was you know, that's what um, you know, Paul Glatt said. Uh, you know, for, for, you know, he came and when you use showed up one weekend after you know after my upgrade. So that's so uh, that's why I ran for a while until just you know it came down. When you use a long antenna like that, a long antenna at high frequencies like twenty. 20, 15, 10, 12, what, what happens is the, you start getting lobes that line up along the way to wire is running and you get a lot of gain on those lobes. So it starts acting like a long wire antenna, uh, but it, you have to understand that. So you have to know where you get maximum gain. Uh, you, you get that maximum gain on those high frequencies over a very narrow beam width. As long as you understand that, then you know what to expect from the antenna and what not to expect from it. But you know, anything will work if you put it up and, and tune it, anything will work. But don't ever fall for that, don't ever fall into that trap of saying, oh, my antenna is fantastic. I worked 
India. And I'm using a 10 meter dipole, five feet above the ground in my, uh, in my basement. Don't ever think that you've got a great antenna just because you worked somebody far away. <laughs> okay, any other uh, thoughts? Jay I'd like to thank everybody for attending. I hope you enjoyed it. And as I mentioned at the start of this, thank you again to Luigi for the terrific graphics. And if you didn't enjoy it, send me an email. I will send you back double the money you paid. All right, have a great day and stay safe.